So here we are back at Senate Government Operations on February 1st um, after a short break. We are going to be looking at S-251, which is a bill about divestiture from fossil fuel companies. And um, so Becky, if you would like to walk us through, and then we have um, with us the treasurer and Tom Galanka, who's the chair of the Vermont in Pension Investment Commission. So, Becky. Thanks, uh, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. So um, S-251 is an act relating to the divestment of state pension funds from fossil fuel companies. Um, so overview is that um, this bill is um, essentially pro prohibiting by July of 2025, um, the Pension Investment Commission from um, investing in companies that have um, uh, certain companies in an index that have uh, fossil fuel uh, reserves. And there is also a transition period from now until July 2025 to sort of stop making those investments and divest from the current, uh, from, from companies that currently meet that um, criteria. Um, on the point of the Pension Investment Commission, um, that name was changed last session, and I've noticed two places in this bill where it still says committee, so I will highlight that, but that would uh, need to be updated. Uh, apologies for that. <laughs> um, so section one of the bill is um, amending the um, Vermont Pension Investment Commission um, definition section. So uh, just moving on to page two of the bill, line, uh, sorry, page three of the bill. So there's a bunch of definitions. Um, line one through five is a definition of fossil fuel. Um, so this definition, I, I, had, I had looked through statute and I could not find um, uh, another definition. There's one of liquid fossil fuels. Um, so this uh, definition was sort of put together uh, based on some consultation with another attorney in our office and um, what was in statute. So I just wanted to note where that came from. But um, fossil fuel means an energy source formed in the Earth's crust from decayed organic material. Um, this is a non-exhaustive list, but it says the term includes petroleum, coal, natural gas, heating oils, light and heavy diesel oils, oil, motor, gasoline, propane, butane, residential fuel oils, kerosene and aviation fuels, and it ex excludes um, biodiesel. Um, section two of the bill is um, amending the, uh, the duties of the Vermont Pension Investment Commission. And it is adding on page four, a new, um, a new uh, duty uh, in subsection I, which says that um, notwithstanding the commission's um, ability to make investments on behalf of the, the, the state retirement systems um, and the teacher system, the commission shall not invest the assets of the teacher's retirement system, the state employee's retirement system and the municipal employee's retirement system and the 200 publicly traded coal and oil and gas companies that hold reported fossil fuel reserves with the largest potential carbon emissions as ranked by FFI solutions. Um, so that ranking is coming from an advisory firm that has created an index of the those top 200 uh, companies. So that is what that is uh, referencing. So it's, uh, the language is, is putting a, a cross-reference in there to an index um, for determining how to uh, decide what can and can't be invested in. Um, and you'll get to this uh, at the end of the bill, but section one and section two, so that definition and the uh, prohibition on investments are not effective until um, July 2025, July 1st, 2025. Um, so that's when that prohibition would go into effect. Section three of the bill is session law, and that is um, kind of creating this transition period. And this is effective upon, upon July 1st, 2022, so this year. Um, so this is 
creating a, a three-year transition period that says, um, and, and on line 14, it says the committee, it should say the commission um, shall not make new or additional investments or renew existing investments um, in any of those uh, companies on that on that index that of those 200 publicly traded coal and oil and gas companies on that index. And also um, during that time period, divest the assets from the three retirement systems from any interest in the, in the companies on that list. Um, and then section four, as I mentioned, the effective dates, so sections one and two, um, the, the prohibition starts in July 25, and then the um, transition period starts July 1st of this year. Any questions of clarification for Becky? Sounds pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Thank you, Becky. Um, I guess we'll jump to who would like to join us first here. Tom, Beth? Girl. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes? Hi, Allison here. Um, I just would like to say as the lead sponsor of this bill, I just, uh, you know, we've been around this bend with Beth for quite a number of years. I think 2011, we had a bill with Keisha and Chris and I in the house and a bunch of others. Uh, it just struck us that at this point in time, given the enormous investment we've made uh, with the Global Warming Solutions Act and with our climate action plan now in place, that really this is an issue that we need to be, and I'm very eager to hear how the uh, VPIC has addressed this because we had promises in 2017 that they would be dealing with it more aggressively. And so I'm quite excited to hear what, they, what their update is on that. But it just struck us all that this is a perfect complement to all the work we're doing with the Climate Action Plan. <laughs> and it just, it's, it's a piece that Senate government operations could contribute to that. So. Uh, it uh, that that that's in large measure why we're here. Thank you, thank you for setting that um, the stage for us. Well, so, Chair, yeah, yes, I would volunteer Tom Galanco to start. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I see that Senator Rom Hensel, did you have a question? I just wanted to add a comment as a past and current sponsor of the bill, which is that it would be really nice in the testimony today to hear about outcomes more than actions, as much as if not more than actions, what the out, outcomes of shareholder activities or things like that have been, um, because I think the emphasis really is, is on having an impact before we experience climate failure. Yeah, oh, thank absolutely. you. Thank you. All right, so since you've been volunteered to go <laughs> first, Tom, would you like to join us? Thanks, Madam Chair. You know, I appreciate the opportunity. You know, obviously, we'd love, love to come back as well to discuss Act 75 and, and the tremendous amount of work that's been done since we last met last summer um, in implementing Act 75. So I'd, I'd love to give an opportunity to update on that. But I don't, this isn't that time, but I'd, I'd love to have that opportunity with Eric to do that as well. I believe, I believe that there is a potential for having a um, joint meeting with institutions because uh, they uh, around that. That'll be great. You know, this is the first year of this experiment yeah. and moving to an independent entity. So there's been a lot of moving parts. And I think yeah. it's really helpful for both Senate GovOps as well as House GovOps and the new pension uh, investment uh, joint committee to, to really weigh in on how we're proceeding. And, and, and I've had tremendous support both from the treasurer's office as well as from the governor's office in regards to creation of a new budget and to, to setting us on this path. We submitted our annual report as well as submitted our uh, independent report for governance study uh, a couple weeks ago. So uh, they're lengthy and I, 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 I would be honored to, to explain those and bring, to bring forth that to this committee at some point in the future. But today in regards to divestment, and I was part of the discussion because I started as chair January 1, I think in 2016, and I proceeded to Governor Shumlin announced the divestment from Exxon Oil. So I know it very well. And I've been intimately involved with Beth on this process, particularly to emphasize active engagement and proxy voting, as well as um, uh, at, at the same time, not, not jeopardizing the pension trust in and of itself because of our small size. and, and uh, our limited scope and scale in, in the state of Vermont. 
So last week at our VPIC meeting, we did have a brief discussion on this. And since that time, I have since followed up with all VPIC members. So I have a general idea of VPIC consensus. And I tried to put that down in a, in a uh, PowerPoint presentation. And I can, we don't need to go to a share screen unless you want, but I can explain each page or go through one by one. And that, that I think could be helpful to sort of frame the discussion in concerns and specific comments on the current bill as it's written. And then we can go from there. Whatever you prefer, I could leave it for open dialogue and, and just sort of visually explain each page one by one, or we could raise it as a, a, a outline. Thank you. I think that we normally don't use um, okay. screen share when we go through bills because we all have access to them and we do have access to this. But okay, I perfect. think that in this case, because you're basing your, your uh, presentation on them committee would you be amenable to having have having Tom do a screen share here and put up sure. his? If he wants, either okay. way. Okay, okay, great. Let me see if I'm able to, Lon. Uh, I don't know how this works at all. Gail, Gail does. needs to make you co-host. Yeah, Gail, could you make me co-host and I can share the screen and then we can go through the different um, uh, slides that I put together, uh, basically to summarize what, uh, we envision as issues um, in regards to uh, divestment, uh, timing, uh, potential alternatives, as well as the specific language of the bill. Um, so, it, sorry, while, while we're doing that, Tom, is is your memo the staff comments on provisions, or is it the no, discussion? My memo would be the divestments. The staff comments, I asked Eric last week to basically summarize a couple of things. One, to give me an estimate on the exposure to this list of stocks based on this uh, FFI solutions that was indicated in the bill. And so I asked Eric to give me an idea of what this would entail, both from a staff perspective, as well as the amount of funds that we're actually looking at, um, particularly in the index funds that we have, and as well as some of the separately managed accounts. And secondly, I asked him to give me a summary of what they've been doing over the past couple of years to summarize for you action items that we have taken as part of our proxy voting, as well as our, to get back to Senator Rom's, uh, Hinsdale's questions in regards to what has been done. Um, in the meantime, what we've done also is we set up a subcommittee of the new independent commission to really identify VPIC and we've chaired, and Beth can explain this more because she's been elected chair of our uh, subcommittee. And so she will be in charge of the policy direction as well as implementation of a lot of our ESG policies going forward. Um, it doesn't seem to be let me sharing the screen. Uh, we have it on our device. We have your. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. You have it on as well. Okay. So I, I just guess I don't see it here, but I'll go through what I, what I've talked to the board members, uh, sort of from page one is the discussion agenda, you know, issues that came up from board members as I was discussing this and as it was uh, presented in, in, in Senate 251. And there's really eight different issues that I think I wanted to address with you today, because I think there are significant and they really go to um, uh, process and collaboration with VPIC, because I'm always open to working with the legislature as well as the Joint Pension Commission, as well as interested parties. And I think that was evident back in 2016 when we set up that group. I think it came up with a lot of good solutions. Um, Vermont is not in a vacuum in this space. I think there's a lot of different uh, players out there. Um, we aren't big enough to really affect immediate change. However, we can affect individual change by our power of co uh, collaboration and support amongst our fellow institutional shareholders. Um, the first issue I really want to go to is the discussion on FFI solutions. And I know it's been highlighted here as an index, but it really is not an established index in the open markets. Um, this is a product that is proprietary. You go to your website and you cannot get this list without paying a subscription fee. So I classify as FFI solutions more as a specific vendor. And one of my comments in regards to legislation is I don't think it's appropriate for state statute to have language of any designated specific vendor. Um, I think specifically that would violate our VPIC policies on manager selection. It would violate our policies on RFP uh, uh, regulations. It would also infringe on our ESG in investment policies. And, and I think it's bad policy to name, uh, name a vendor, uh, particularly in any legislation. If you look at the main legislation in this regard, they did not list any um, specific vendors. They strictly identified divestment. They identified the issue. 
and directed uh, the VMER or the, the main plan to, to implement an action in that respect. Um, I also think listing FFI solutions, regardless of their, their quality, uh, it may be one that, that VPIC would look into, it, it diminishes VPIC's negotiating power in order to work with a vendor. And I think that would really form a fiduciary conflict between VPIC and this current legislation. So I, I strongly recommend you strike any name uh, vendor in any future legislation. Um, the second aspect is in regards to fiduciary responsibility. And I, I bring up this because we really, as a, as a, as a board, we really have to have this as, as our underlying uh, driving you know, force in regards to managing the pension assets of the state of Vermont. And so having legislation and then having a fiduciary standard, sometimes they come into conflict. And I think we need, need to have a way or some way, and I don't, I'm really throwing this issue out there, how do we handle a conflict of this nature where VPIC may consider a, a fiduciary breach, whereas there's in statute certain specific prescriptions that we would need to follow? And I think there needs to be some clarity in this in regards to that. I go back to Maine's proposal, and in Maine's proposal, they had a simple statement in there where they said, um, uh, let's see, the treasurer of state shall, in accordance with sound investment criteria, and consistent with fiduciary obligations divest. And so Maine's gotten around this by actually listing um, the fiduciary standard as sort of a, a superior law, as it were, in regards to what the pick board should look at. And I think you really seriously need to consider something like that in any future legislation that considers any type of uh, divestment. Not saying I agree with divestment, because I think active engagement is, is the best way to approach, but if you do have any legislative language, I really strongly suggest that you include some type of reference to fiduciary standard in that. The next area is, I think is in regards to the specifics. So if you get into the specifics of what does this entail and how do we measure how much money or exposure VPIC may have to this list of 200 stocks. And as I said earlier, it was very difficult finding this list. Um, it's not publicly available. I actually found it when, through our conversations with the CIO of Maine because they actually had this list. And from there, and luckily VPIC has invested in software, thanks to Beth and thanks to her foresight into having oversight or, or look through into our portfolio our new matrix system allows us to really have good insight into our plan, um, both on the overall level, but actually on the granular level. And so it took a lot of work, but I had staff pull through the matrix data and look at those 200 stocks and basically cross-reference what exposure we would have out of the $6 billion portfolio. And Madam of the Chair, names, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, Senator. Can I, are we asking questions now? Cause I feel like you moved on from the last slide and I wasn't, Sure. Oh, sure. I, I don't see sure. the slide, so I'm just going by. Uh, oh, by okay. okay. I'm just trying to go through what the different slides one by one. But yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions on any of the slides. Oh, great. Um, sure. Terrific, because as we go along. Yeah, on the slide, I mean, I feel like it's the second slide that pulls out from the theme and it's fiduciary yep. responsibility. I yep. wasn't sure if you'd moved on to the 200 list VPIC exposure because you started talking about the list of 200. I just moved on to that. Yeah, okay. I apologize. So, <laughs> so in the fiduciary responsibility section, mm -hmm. you you talk about you you talk. I don't know. You didn't just talk about the Maine, uh, New York, and California experience more broadly. There is a statement there that the California experience has resulted in an eight yeah. billion dollar loss. First of all. Well, it's, it's an unrealized loss versus their, uh, their the corresponding index. And we had an email from the CIO from CalSTRS that basically quotes that. And so that came directly from his annual report to California. And so- Okay, well, there, just wanted to make two comments about that one. I sure. mean, California is, I think, still the eighth largest economy in the world. So $8 billion for them is something very different than, mm -hmm. than $8 billion for us. And two, my- understanding is that is potentially for all divestment and they've divested from a lot of other things as well. California has a kind of robust divestment policy that mm -hmm. has um, other other pieces of it. So that's not just climate divestment. Well, 
Yes, and I agree. I think the, the the point of listing that was I think there's some experiences out there that I think we can gain knowledge from, whether it's through mm -hmm. uh, looking at how Maine has implemented it, whether looking at how New York has approached it. New York's approached it through a policy driven approach where they have an internal list and they have active staff that goes towards divestment. California has done something similar um, where they have an active staff. We have three staff people. Um, they have hundreds of people that they can draw on this to create an individual index. If I could have five more staff people, I'd, I'd love to be able to say, yeah, we could do this tomorrow, um, you know, because then we could, we could pick and choose different things that we have. But the problem is we don't have that. And we have constraints, fiscal constraints and size and scope of what Vermont is. The 8 billion number, you're right. It comes from a statement from the CIO in his annual report on what his calculation calculation was for lost opportunity costs from the comparable index from their divestment process. It's not specifically fossil fuels, and I want to make yeah. that clear. You're right. And what percentage, I mean, I don't know if you know, but the percentage has got to be very different for well, such California a large has, state. Uh, CalSTRS has about $260 billion, as I recall. So do the math would be $8 billion off of growth on that. Okay. And so this is just one pension fund in California, their CalSTRS program. But uh, it's, as I recall, it's about $250 billion. But I can, I can, I can double check that number in regards okay. to what that reference is. And I can get you their, their annual report where he, he explains his, cons, his uh, concerns and, and how they measure it. My point is really, this is the things that I think a, a, a proper study would look at before we implement any divestment strategy and or policy um, understand the implications that potentially could occur if it were to be enacted. And I think that's really all I'm looking to say there. And, and, yeah. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Oh, and Anthony too, I'm oh, sorry. I, I sort of thought that's what we un, you guys undertook in 2017 in yeah. our agreement with the treasurer and VPIC is that you were going to study this all fairly fully and come back to us. Well, we've even funded, you know, I think Senator Clarkson, we've all also one of the provisions of that 2017 study was to pre-fund a carbon uh, neutral uh, uh, index fund uh, that we could then have other states join in and uh, work through BlackRock. And we've actually funded that to the point of $200 million. And so we're in the process of exploring how that impacts our index fund how we could potentially add more to that. And that's more of an internal investment that VPIC has already made. So one of our indexes is, is, is already invested in that. And that's that's a definite action. Beth can explain more during her presentation, right. okay, her discussion. Great. But that definitely is, we have, we have looked at that. And of the five recommendations back in 2017, we've met all five. So you can look at, have we met them enough? That's a great question. And how can we do better? Um, uh, we're working on it. And, and I think that can be the message that we're, we, we haven't just put it in a shelf and said, we're not acting on this. We have an active um, ESG program, not necessarily just in fossil fuels, but if you look at the second document that I attached, which was a staff commentary, I also asked Eric to give me a list of, well, what Katie and Eric and Beth and ESG group has been working on over the past couple of years. And Although, yes, we may not be successful on all of these, I think being at the table and putting our voice forth on different issues, whether it's fossil fuels, whether it's been a pay on, you know, pay compensation issues, whether it's been deforestation issues, whether it's been uh, labor relations issues with Hilton, I think we've had good experience in all of our ESG policies. So I think Anth Senator Polina had a question. Yeah, I don't wanna beat California to death, but I think given the context of the slides that we're looking at, since we're talking about divestment from fossil fuels, to say that California's had lost opportunities of $8 billion, somebody reading this would assume that you meant that due to fossil fuels, when in fact, as Keisha Ram Hinsdale suggested, California's in divested from tobacco, from gun makers, from the Sudan, from Iran, they've, they've divested from many things. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. And also just recently, oh, yeah. the teachers in California Teachers in California decided to move forward with net zero emissions yeah. policy. So they clearly felt pretty good about that investment so far if the teachers are willing to go even further. Yeah, you mentioned I, New York and you mentioned New York in that same paragraph and New York actually divested New York City and New York State, as you know, and they did it sooner than they thought they had projected that would take them a number of years and they ended up doing it quicker than they thought. So yeah, it's, just, it's misleading in a way. Well, I, I, I apologize if it's misleading. I'm quoting the CIO of California, Calsters, in, in regards to his view on divestment and how it's impacted their portfolio. And I'd be happy to clarify that in regards to where, okay. uh, where that came from. 
Uh, and I, I meant it only as a way to say, well, VPIC's questions to me were, well, how have other states responded and what has been their experience? Maine's new, uh, New York has a policy that seems to be being implemented. It's not legislation and California seems to be working internally. Um, we're on the cutting edge here of where, you know, where we're at. So I, there's not many examples. And I think those, those three for state examples are very good ones for us to look at and not necessarily copy, but to model any type of future legislation or not, or policies based on their experience, whether good or bad. If, if good things have worked out of their policies, implement those, if, if, if things that have been bad. And that, that my point is that we need to look at from a VPIC perspective, how other experiences in the country have affected those pension plans, because they're gonna affect us the same way, just at a different scale. No, I, I agree with that for sure. I mean, we're sort of breaking new ground here. Yep. The other states have moved forward, but there's a lot to learn as we go forward with this movement as well. Sure. Yeah, well, so, I, I, I think yes. New York is, is looking like a, a very interesting model to look at. And I, I think you talk about losses uh, in, in, the Cal, uh, in California, in the Calster's uh, situation. Uh, we, <laughs> fossil fuel investments may be a huge liability in the future as, as, as fossil fuel companies are sued uh, for the cost of climate destruction, mm -hmm. it, it, we may be on the hook for huge liabilities by owning those stocks. And and can I suggest that we might let uh, Tom go through his presentation before we start arguing with him about what we should be doing? <laughs> I, don't, I don't view it as arguments. I view it but, as- But I do, well, it's but- It's an interesting way to view where are the loss, you know, what, what is considered a loss anyway. So I, I just, we, I would like to let Tom continue his presentation and then um, if we have questions of clarification, and I believe the initial question from Senator Rom Hinsdale was a question of clarification about what what does the loss um, include? So, but yeah. before I, I we- I can get you that, that loss and we can upload it as a, yeah. as a addendum to the document, that'd be fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so going on to the next page in regards to what does your specific legislation propose and how does that impact VPEC in regards to our current holdings? And as I said, I looked at the portfolio over the past couple of days to try to ferret out what those 200 names are, how much are they in the portfolio and, and where we are? What, what would it actually entail if, if we had to divest of the current portfolio? And what I came out with, it's about $150 million out of the 6 billion portfolio. And that works out to be about two and a half percent. Um, or say 97.5% list free as it were. So we're well on our way to being close to out of this list, uh, getting to uh, your question in regards to what is the exposure of uh, fossil fuel stocks, this is it. Um, it's very difficult to get out of it completely when you have a very low indexing strategy, particularly one as uh, that balances out our abilities with only three staff people, as well as the amount of money that we're trying to invest at a, in a meaningfully uh, timely way and a quick and efficient way. And so indexing has been the strategy that VPIC has employed over the past couple of years. And so having two and a half percent exposure is, is what I've gathered uh, with, with mainly our index funds, both our U.S and our Acqui uh, International Index Funds and some separately management accounts, particularly some bonds. Now this includes both bonds and stocks. So there's bonds in there um, that may pay us 3%, 4%, 5% that may be owned by you know, Mitsubishi, for example. I, I noticed Mitsubishi was on the list. We have some Mitsubishi bonds. Um, there was some uh, on the other list, there was LG. Um, it didn't specify what division of LG and we do have some exposure to LG. It's the big tele, tele a big, big television company out in, in, in Asia. Um, second, another third aspect I want to point in is here. This does not include calculating any private equity positions that we currently have. Um, we currently have a fund to fund approach and our current software program does not have the ability to really drill down into our fund managers to the detail level like we have in, in, our, in, in our index and separately managed account portfolios. Um, that's not as significant a problem now, but as we roll out our private equity and private debt positions over the next five years, which is a plan of EPIC, um, it could be more difficult, particularly to, to have that look through and to follow a specific legislation in regards to private equity. Um, we're kind of at the mercy of, 
you know, funds that we're in. Um, our goal always with private equity has been to uh, get into top quartile uh, private equity positions. We do have an ESG process that vets them during our RFP period. And we do ask this question, particularly our ESG policy and our ESG questions as part of the RFP. After the fact or after we get invested in them, that is an issue that we'll have to address. Um, and the last piece I want to say about this 200 list, um, it's proprietary and it's not easily determined who's going to set it up and who's going to change it. And are we abrogating our, our fiduciary duties by giving away responsibility to a different firm in regards to the creation of this list? I'd be more inclined to recommend working internally, boosting internal staff if need be to um, create our own internal list based on internal Vermont uh, uh, divet, uh, carbon policies, which I'd like to call them uh, in, in that regard. The next page I'd like to point out is regards to my impact on index strategies. And so legislation like this, although it, it, it sounds good, it has great sound bites, but it has material Im impact on indexing. Um, it really would cause VPIC to question our indexing strategy altogether. If we're going to have to subtract an index, an S&P index from an index, and in essence, in essence, turn an index strategy into an active strategy, we might as well create our own active strategy altogether in terms of Vermont. Now, the problem with that is it costs a lot more to have a completely active strategy for investing money. Um, my argument would be, do we make our policy based on the 2.5% that we have invested or do we make our investment policy based on the 97.5% that we have invested in? And my argument would be do as best we can for as cheap as we can um, in the 97% to maximize our investment return. Um, so I'm very concerned that implications that are sort of, it would be a sort of a casualty of this legislation potential would be that we would have to abandon to some extent our indexing strategy. I know there are some indexes out there that we could use. The problem with some of those, particularly those listed on the FFI website, is that they're very small. Um, some of them have assets of 100 million in them. Some have assets of only a billion dollars in them. Um, those indexes we could not theoretically use because we don't want to be more than 10% of any one investment manager in any of our investments. So we want to have really broad diversification, both from what we buy as well as how much we buy with each of our managers. The bigger funds on that list by FFI, there were some by Parnassus which are, and Calvert, which are big, which we could potentially look at. And I'm not precluding the possibility that we could look at these. All had basis point charges of over 60 basis points, uh, 60 basis points to 90 basis points. And so do the math. Um, we're paying two basis points on $3 billion. If we had to pay 60 basis points on $3 billion, you're gonna increase internal costs by $15 million a year. That's not exactly what we do. We try to make some different arrangement by either increasing staff or um, you know, changing, the, maybe contracting out with different entities, maybe working with BlackRock to expand our current investment that we just made in, in more capable way. We're not willing to do that yet because VPIC does not have the data yet to justify completely making that switch. So we need, we need years of, you know, at least a year or two years to see how the tracking error has occurred between our current indexing strategy and our carbon free strategy before I think we can make a bigger commitment. But that's definitely on the horizon. So I really caution you that any divestment bill that doesn't address VPIC's current indexing strategy could be very detrimental for Vermont taxpayers, as well as our funding capability going forward. And so I really caution you that we've structured our whole portfolio to have the core of it be indexed. And until there's a really viable index alternative that VPIC feels comfortable meets our fiduciary duty, I would caution to say, don't put us on a July 1, 2022 timeline to cancel out our investments. The timeline proposed in the current legislation says we can't invest any new money in any of these stocks. I don't know how we do it July 1, 2022, if, if this went through. 
And the reason I say that is you're, you plan on giving us 300 million or so in additional initial contributions based on the, the pension task force. <clears throat> we wouldn't theoretically be able to invest it in our current investment mix. And we'd have to have some type of transition period that would be well longer than three months to, to really adequately address this indexing strategy issue. So that's my point on indexing. And I don't want to belabor it, but I think with Vermont and how we've structured our portfolio, I really need you to know how this has worked. The next page, I want to go into impact on private investments. Now, the bill does not really specify either to include or exclude private, private equity and or co-mingled accounts. And the reason I bring up private equity, because private equity in and of itself is one, in, one of only two asset classes that we have in the portfolio that are over 7% expected rate of return. And I'll give you some anecdotal information about why private equity is important. Um, yesterday, uh, my alma mater, so I'll throw it out there, Notre Dame, came out with the investment performance for their endowment. Um, they made 53% in, in last fiscal year. So they went from 14 billion <clears throat> to 20 billion in investable assets. And the primary reason they stayed it was they have 45% in private equity. We're never going to have that. We're never going to expose Vermont to that level of private equity exposure. But I will tell you, our whole strategy for private equity started from my conversation with the chief investment officer of Notre Dame, because I called him back in 2016 and I discussed how do we implement a private equity strategy? How do, what do we look for? And his comments to me were, make sure you're in top 25th quartile or you're not going to get any benefit diversify away and do it over time. And that's what we've been doing really since 2000, 2016, 2017. We've really accelerated it with Eric because we've had the, 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 the power of a CIO that has tremendous uh, private equity exposure, but we've really gotten into top tier performance in our private equity, um, in our private equity portfolio. Right now we have about 1.3 billion in committed capital. About 600 million of that is working for us. The other 700 million or so is out there that we've already committed. We've already signed contracts on. We're just waiting for them to call it away. I have no understanding of how this law would potentially impact contracts we've already signed with um, a divestment policy that in essence says you can't do any more after July 1, 2022. My concern is twofold. One, we wouldn't be able to meet, um, we wouldn't be able to invest in any more private equity, uh, at least in top quartile. We'd be, we'd be, we do not have the capability at this point or the clout, quite frankly, to dictate terms to private equity firms to say, you can't buy these 200 stocks or you can't buy these stocks that are listed by this firm that isn't an industry standard in, in, in the industry. And quite frankly, they'd come back to us and say, okay, Vermont, thank you, we'll look at someone else. Because a lot of the funds we go into are, are closed funds, are, are funds that are very difficult to get into, and they've been worked over years of relationship building in regards to expanding our private equity piece. I really fear that any law or any legislation that does not specifically exclude private equity or private debt would cause significant, a significant downward spiral in what VPIC could justify as an actuarial rate of return. Um, and so I, I say that in, because I really understand private equity takes time and effort and a commitment. And if we lose the pipeline to roll that out to what we anticipate we want in our portfolio, which is about 20%, and then uh, you know, that's with private equity and private debt, um, until we get there, I think we're at a real significant um, disadvantage because uh, once we're in, we're in and we can, we can roll the monies over. But as we build this out, it's significantly important to maintain those relationships or we'll end that and we'll have to index the rest of that piece of the portfolio, which has, you know, the last study that we used for last year's actuary report had private equity rates of return expected at eight and three quarters to nine, clearly above the 7% large cap growth stocks had an expected rate of return going forward of only six and change, 6%. Do the math, we replace a 9% expected rate of return with a 6% rate of return. 
I don't know any other way than to come back to you and say, we need to revisit our expected rate of returns for the state of Vermont. And I know what we went through over the past year. So I really caution you, private equity needs to be excluded and commingled funds need to be excluded in any discussion about this, at least at this point. Uh, I think we use our proxy voting. You know, I'll look, you know, you ask for examples of how do we, how do we go for private equity and how do we, uh, how do we advocate for our positions there? Well, we have an advisory position on the ESG committee at HarborVest, one of the top tier private equity firms out there that has beaten industry averages consistently over a 15 year period. We've done tremendously well with them on our, on our rate of return. Uh, our staff has, a, has a, a position on their ESG committee to affect change and actually bring these issues uh, to the private equity uh, landscape. If we're not there, we're not there and we won't be able to advocate for our positions going forward. So. That's my, my sort of uh, comments on private equity, but I really caution you against that. Good night. Uh, yep. so, yes, Ron, um, so I think this is one of the areas where I was hoping that you talk about outcomes over actions. So you said, you know, if we're not there, we're not influencing the decisions. Being there, can you talk about an impact on reversing greenhouse gas emissions from, from those, those actions and activities? Well, one of the activities, and I know Beth may hate me for this because she has issues with Nuveen. We've invested in Nuveen as a private equity investor in, uh, in farmland. And, and one of the issues with that is they, uh, they had issues with, um, issue with buying farmland is, is burning of uh, fossil fuels in the Amazon. And so what we advocated for and what we affected change was they took out all of the Brazilian assets in our investment. Now they still have other investments er elsewhere but we brought to the table an issue that we were very concerned with was we don't want to invest in different these asset classes and we were able for them to guarantee that in our investment we would not have any uh, burning of uh, the established uh, the, the industry standards and we help advocate for that now there's issues there i'm not saying it's perfect but we have had impact in that regard in advocating for change at the at the top level in regards to private investments with fossil fuel uh, emissions in in farmland development is it perfect? No, but I think it's it's a it's it's one example. I'm I'm con I'm confused because because it sounds like you're saying that they they helped you divest your funds from that activity. It it didn't change investment from that firm in the activity, but you divested from burning farmland. No, we weren't. No. No, they formed a fund that didn't have that in that because of concerns like investors like Vermont had. And we invested in that fund that didn't have any of that exposure in it. So the, the change was before we invested, we required as part of the RFP process for them to explain to us their, um, their policies in regards to the rainforest in, in the Amazon. And so it's, they didn't change our, we didn't have any money invested in it at that point. We just didn't go into it until we had assurance that it met our internal policies on ESG. That being one of a big concern that VPIC had brought to the table. There's still issues there. Maybe we may want to, we may find they're not following through and we may pull our money out of it um, at the end of our contract term, which comes up in November. Um, that's one example. I don't want to say that we've, you know, Vermont's a small player in this space. Um, can we affect them to change their policies? Uh, if you read their annual report for Nuveen, they have changed significantly since we've joined them where they have more disclosure. They have list out their assets in regards to where they have uh, uh, issues of, of, uh, of, of climate change. And, and in that regard, uh, Amazon issues uh, that cause significant problems. So I, I, I don't wanna say we, we change things completely completely, but I think it was incremental in regards to what our actions were. Beth can explain more about the proxy voting. Um, Beth, I don't know if you want to explain a lot of the ExxonMobil efforts that you've undertaken. Um, th that I think has resulted in, you know, varied levels of success. However, I'll, I'll leave that to Beth to explain her, her opinion on, on individual companies like that. I think I'll do that uh, when, when I do the presentation, okay. if that's okay. Um, I, if I could comment, I think there's a, a misunderstanding here between invest and divest. And when I look at the, uh, the New York policy, for instance, it's more heavily toward engagement, period, 
and, and, and a divestment appears to be a last resort. What they're doing with their index fund is it's an internal index fund uh, that they're able to create because they have the staff. And when Tom said hire five more, I'm thinking you need 15, Tom, to do this. But um, uh, what, what is the size of Maine? Uh, 12? Something 12. Like There's 12, 12. investment executives. There's six with this FFI solution. So I looked on yep. the website for FFI. They only have six people. Yep. Maine has 12, and they're struggling with how they're going to implement uh, yep. their, their current legislation. But you can build it. If you have the staff, you can build an internal index fund uh, that, uh, that has uh, uh, a low carbon impact. That's invest, not divest. And what, uh, what Tom has done with the uh, $200 million uh, with the, um, the, the passive index is it's a separately managed fund, we're in it. And it's at uh, 200 million, we can, we're certainly gonna look to whether we can increase that down the road. And we're hoping that other folks want, in the future will wanna join that fund. That was our goal number two in that five point plan. And if we're able to do that, that's an example of invest as opposed to divest and a divestment that's blanket that doesn't allow you to do this type of um, uh, a invest and, and engagement first, I think is, um, is, a, is a mistake. But I wanted to get across the difference between what, what I see New York versus the main legislation. The main legislation is a, is a blanket. The New York approach is to take a look and say, what are our alternatives to engage these folks? And when is it to a point that you can't do any more? And, that, and also why we're doing this, that's creating an investment strategy that gets us to a low carbon economy, which is what we're trying to do as well. So I'm, I'm gonna jump in here and say that in about um, uh, 12 minutes, I have to leave to go to a chair's minute meeting. Um, so we can keep on and Anthony, would you just um, take over? Well, sure, I'd be more than willing to do that, but I really think it's important for the whole committee to be here for this conversation. Um, I agree, but I uh, know that we have, I, I'm not sure we can finish, even finish the um, presentations oh. in the next 15 minutes. So I would yeah. ask, I guess, Beth and Tom, if you uh, would prefer this to come back on another day. I can get through my presentation pretty quickly because the rest of it is just saying solutions that we could potentially could work with collaboratively. And, um, you know, I don't want to belabor impact on rate of return assumptions. So, you know, that's kind of everything I've said in regards to what we're now responsible for. Obviously, we have to look at rate of return. And um, next spring, we have to do an experience study in regards to what the current um, breakdown is. And I'd hate to be able to, I'd hate to have to take out the private equity piece in regards to us in our, in our calculation. Um, the last piece, timeline, I do think it's aggressive. Uh, 7122 is way too early in regards to us to get out of our indexing strategy and to have a clear, coherent message for our private equity piece. Um, we have contracts already outstanding. Um, I don't know how we'd affect those or how we'd even look at in, in interpreting those contracts in 722. Maine, for example, didn't put it out till 7-1-2026. So you're even significantly more aggressive than Maine who passed their law uh, a couple months ago. And, and so I, I'd implore you that this transition period needs to be seriously revisited if this, if this, uh, if this goes into effect. Um, I'd also say Act 75 has taken a lot of staff time to implement. Um, if we are going to undertake an effort like this, I will need to bring this up to appropriations in regards to amending our budget that we submitted from the governor's office. Uh, we would need more staff. We would need money for studies. We would need money uh, that I think has not been allocated for. You're already asking us in Act 75 to implement a compensation study as well as an asset li liability study, which we both budgeted for and we look forward to doing over the next year. If we're gonna also be asked to implement a divestment strategy, um, last time we did this in 2017, um, a follow-up investment would need would probably be at least $60,000, um, possibly more. I apologize for this. My daughter's calling me. Um, I, uh, I think budgeting would have to be addressed in, in any regard in regards to this timeline for fiscal 23 into fiscal 24 and, and include and some type of transition budget. So with that, I would end with alternatives. And I think 
I asked Eric to say, well, what have you been thinking about in regards to how do we mend our ESG policy if we were to add some type of carbon policy, similar to New York? I think I'm more apt to go the New York route in regards to looking at policy. Um, let's take our time. Let's look at this thoroughly, look at the experience of other states. Don't implode what we've accomplished over the past five years and see the progress we've already made. And, and I would argue we have made tremendous progress. I've given you 11 pages of things that our three person staff has done with best assistance. If we have the staff and we have the personnel to do more in the future, I'd love to do it. You know, I, I do believe addressing carbon is a core issue that investors need to look at. How we do that is through as best as invest, not divest. How we do it as using our seat at the table to advocate for change, not by sitting in the stands eating, you know, the argument would be you're either playing on the field or you're sitting in the stands. And I view divestment as sitting in the stands. And, and I'd hate to do that for Vermont at the same time as give up the really good work we've done with our private equity rollout, as well as our indexing. So with you, with that, thank you for your time. And I'll turn it any questions that you may have. Senator Polina. Well, I would just say, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think, like any new piece of legislation, it's a starting point. And you know, when we talk about implementation and timelines and strategies, there's, we're more than willing to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at what other states have done, like you point to New York, which I, from what I can tell, also did a good job of working through what they wanted to do. I just think that, you know, there's other places that have done this. And I don't know if any of them have come back and said that they're financially ruined because they divested. Now, it clearly hasn't been that long a period of time yet. You know, maybe I'm not time saying will tell. Ruined. I'm saying we need to change our expectations if we're going to do this in the current way or change the current way. If you want right. to give me 10 more people and you want to give you want to you want to really make an internal investment staff, we could have our own internal indexes. I don't know if that's feasible in the state of Vermont. Sure. Are 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 there places that I mean we're we are pretty small compared to even even places like Notre Dame and Harvard and stuff, I, I think that our investments are pretty small, but are there other places that are as small as we are that are able to ha create their own internal index with three people? I mean, I, I, you can probably you need to create your own internal index. I mean, is well, that remember, you have to be able what? to define what you're trying to, you know, it's hard to beat the indexes and it's hard to craft your own index of uh, time. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of reasons why people have indexed over the years and use the established indexes. Um, you know, you're seeing S and P carve out sectors. So you can mm -hmm. buy different sectors and, and short different sectors. And those are, those are new phenomenon over the past 15, 10, 15 years. Um, I, I think, you know, Vermont's, not unique, but we have unique issues. You know, we have we have huge cash flow needs, and we have huge unfunded liabilities, and so managing for that has been be more of a priority than than addressing, um, you know, internally indexing. I'd love to be able to internally index if we had three people and and we we could manage it ourselves, then we could really earmark it for what portfolio we'd like. But you know, you're competing against global players for talent. And, I, and one of the uh, recommendations from RVK, our independent governance consultant, was that we really have at risk here in Vermont, um, key man risk. You know, we have three people and the pool of talent is relatively small for the amount of money that we're able to pay in regards to current salaries. And so I'm really looking forward to this governance study just to see how could we restructure VPIC you know, now that we're new and independent, we can explore these different questions. We can explore what's the right size internal staff versus external consultants. I'd hate to give 60 basis points to Wall Street if we have to go a different uh, active management for large cap stocks. I think that would be a terrible move and $15 million mistake. Um, but we would all, I, think we would all, I think we would all agree with that. Of, yeah. course, of course we'd agree with it. And just to answer Jeanette's question, Jeanette, there have been over 1,300 institutions. I, I, I realize that. I I, yeah. I know that. I'm just saying we are relatively small. And I just wondered if there are institutions that are as small as we are that have created their own internal index with the limited staff, or do they have more staff people in there? Um, I, that was my question. Is not we, we have a bare bones staff. You're not going to find much smaller than three. 
you know, uh, in, in anyone trying to run three, $6 billion, I would argue. Yeah. That, I mean, that was my question. I just wanted yeah. to and know. We'll if, I think we'll find out. That's a good can I ask a follow-up question, Madam Chair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. Does that mean that shareholder activism and things like that are getting short shrift or does that somehow take less staff capacity? No, I wouldn't say that they're getting short shift. I think Katie and Andy and, and Eric have done a tremendous job of identifying the areas of our portfolio that we think are of priority, whether it's been through, um, you know, actions on climate with our with our commitment to the ExxonMobil proxy voting, or whether it's through issues like a compensation or issues um, in regards to, I know there were some union issues that we addressed with, with Marriott Corp a, a year and a half ago. Um, we prioritize activism where we can. We aren't an activist group, so it's not our nature to just be activists. However, we do believe in following through on our ESG policies and if we were to create a new carbon policy, we'd incorporate that more in our activist uh, strategy. And we'd identify those companies we feel we could advocate for change better. There's gonna be some we may decide like New York does that it's beyond hope and we should get out of. And, and from that perspective, then we'd have a fiduciary process that went through the steps of identifying what we can do as activists and what we can't do. And when is the time to pull the trigger and say, let's move on and just not, not even try anymore. Um, effective change for climate is gonna take a lot of effort, not necessarily just with investment, divest, in divestment, I mean, it's gonna take advocacy. I think the legislature has more power in your, your uh, we, uh, toolkit to affect more change, you know, it may be more unpalatable, but you know, immediate impacts are not going to be affected by us selling our stock right now. It's going to take years and years for that to materialize. And I don't think you have years and years in regards to climate activism, but that's my own personal opinion. Um, but I, I think um, we will do our part. We just need to have a way to do it in the state of Vermont and structuring VPIC in a way uh, will be helpful, but I, I, we're willing to collaborate, I guess is what I'm trying to and <laughs> answer that by. Could we, um, could I ask uh, Becky maybe, and maybe it's already there and I just didn't see it yet, but get us a kind of a, an outline or Tom or Beth of the New York, how they, how they did that and the kind of the steps that they took around um, wh what do we do and then when is the time to get out? Sure. Okay. Uh, I do have, I think Eric had requested that from Tom Lee, who's the uh, CIO of New York. And I think okay. I have it. I think he sent me a bunch of the New York policies and timelines and procedures that they've implemented. I can yeah. forward that. And he's indicated that he'd be willing to work with us in regards to determining how it could be effective in Vermont. Okay. And I'll send everybody the New York Times article about, about, about the announcement, and um, which was in August of mm -hmm. 21. Yeah, I think Tom Lee forwarded that to, yeah. So I have Tom Lee's internal policy discussion and documents yeah. that New York worked on in regards to their policy. So those are the type of things that I think are effective and, and could be helpful for us at VPIC to determine well, what it, what works and what doesn't. Um, yeah. And I think this final thought would be that when you talk about the activism and working with corporations to change their behavior, that's fine and good. But going back to what Senator Rob Hinsdale said earlier when we started the meeting, we would like to know like places where that actually made a difference in terms of keeping petroleum in the ground, you know, not really had an impact on the way they do business. I mean, it's nice to have their boards be more diversified and whatnot. I'm not putting that down at all. That's really important. Well, but, the example that, that the example that that Beth always brings up is Total and their investment in solar. I think there has been some fossil fuel related energy companies that have made significant investments in alternative energy, uh, whether it's solar or wind or, or uh, other areas that I think would be effective. I view, you know, who has the capital to affect change as well. And so, if you can, if you can, if you can force these companies in some way to affect their own change and work from within because they have the capital to do it. Um, sure. I don't know if ExxonMobil is the one that will do that. I don't know mm -hmm. if, if World of Shell will be, but I, but I think they're the ones that do have the capital and the infrastructure to actually start that process. You're seeing radical change in some of the, the car companies, whether they're, they're right. generating electric cars, and that seems to be coming about a lot quicker. Yeah. Because well, I think of, we, all, we all had hopes for BP, but I haven't, I'm not sure I've seen it 
materialize as much with BP. Yeah. I, I think one of the, I, and then I'm going to jump off because um, I'm late already, but one of the oh, things that we? we also are looking at, this is only looking at divesting from fossil fuels, right? I, I mean, this doesn't have anything to do with your earlier example about uh, saving the Amazon rainforests, which is a huge, mm -hmm. huge issue. So if we're only talking about fossil fuels, that's one avenue, but there are other other ways of getting to where we want to get to, which is um, saving our planet. So well, from an investment perspective, we do consistently get requests in regards to well, how, and we, we try to incorporate that in our ESG policy. Strengthening mm -hmm. that and, and adding different features to it is always an objective with you pick at this point. Yep. I'm going to jump off and I'm going to, um, yeah. we'll schedule this again. Um, Gail, Gail and I are going to work on our next week's schedule tomorrow at noon. So we'll see where we get, but we will schedule this again. Okay. And Beth, I apologize for not. All right. I've, I've got more than 15 minutes. Um, I, sorry, and, now, <laughs> and now it's three minutes past the 15. So Thank I'm going to go. Yeah. I'm going to go. Realize we were 15 minutes late. Bye. <laughs> um, Clarkson has to leave also, right? Yeah. yeah. So thank you. This was Bye. a great start and uh, very interesting for, I look forward to pursuing this with you both. Thanks. Same here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that uh, we we will be able to uh, to get into your point, uh, Representative Ron, uh, uh, Senator, excuse me, Senator Ron Hinsdale. Um, I, I still remember you from over, over on the other side. So worked very cooperatively with you there as well. Uh, there are substantive examples of where we've made change. And I think that that's important. Getting to the Exxon issue, um, I, I would like to recommend uh, that you uh, uh, ask us to bring in a group called Engine One. This is where Exxon doubled down on oil. Others are making other choices. And for the first time in its history, it had uh, three members of its board of directors ousted um, by, and, uh, and uh, folks that are energy folks, but are more toward diversification. And that came from, uh, from Engine One, one, I think it's a private equity firm. Uh, they spoke to about a dozen treasurers, including me, about some of the issues and why they picked Exxon and how that all worked. This is a success story. I mean, never in their history. And in fact, I think that uh, I remember uh, members of uh, 350 calling it a, um, uh, a groundbreaking event and, and the like. So I think we should bring them in to talk a little bit about engagement. And I, I would certainly be happy to reach out to them uh, we did as treasurers, and I think that that would be very important. And I think that um, this global, you know, you talked, uh, Senator uh, Polina, about this being the first shot. I think we do need to do some type of study. I took a look at Maine. They're doing a study now. In November, the board said that we would do get hire with a group of experts, a um, a, um, um, a group of experts, and do an RFP to to assess the impact on investments. Now. I, I appreciate that they're, 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 they're having to do that now. And I think the board, um, or the pension board is being very proactive in doing that. We did that in 17 and we did it in an extraordinarily mm -hmm. collaborative manner. I would recommend don't do the legislation and then find out you have a problem. Do the study up front um, and do it in a way that we did last time, which was extraordinarily uh, collaborative. And in the end, we had endorsement of the five point plan and again, Senator, I would be happy to talk about the actions and the results from that uh, from from that plan. Um, and let's let's do that. Um, let's look at ways that you can invest, uh, and not the blanket divestment is not what I see that's been successful in other pension investments. Um, when you talk about endowments and you talk about uh, other other types of educational agencies, there are different uh, different rules around it, different strategies. Uh, Notre Dame, I'm a fan of Notre Dame too, by the way, but um, uh, the, uh, the uh, I don't know if that helped me, but uh, the, uh, but uh, hopefully there are no Michigan fans listening, but uh, the, um, uh, that's, that strategy works for an endowment. It doesn't work for pension funds. Uh, we need to have that conversation. I'd love to go back and talk about some of those issues and the success stories that are there, but I do think that we put the cart before the horse. We haven't done our homework at the front end about what are those strategies? Well, but we, have, we, have not, we, have not, we have not committed to divestment yet. So we haven't put the horse before the cart. We haven't loaded up the cart yet. We haven't put the horse well, on the in yeah. front of the wagon. We're basically well, talking about 
I don't I, I don't want to see a study. I want I would like to see a strategy perhaps where, where we come back with the plan on how we're going to divest, yeah. do the right thing, whether it's commingled funds or the, the singular funds that we invest in. I mean, there's things that we can do that we don't need to study like what 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 we need to do. We need to decide on how we're going to go about doing it. So I think that's where the focus should be. I would suggest um, two things, Senator. First, um, you don't fill up the cart until you know what you want to put in the cart. Okay. Right. Whether that's why I said we haven't closed. filled up the cart yet. Yeah, but you can't do that without doing some investigation. Part of and we the have a number of other states. We have a bunch of other states and entities that have we could learn from instead of we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, I think that you just need to put to the cart in an analogy further. Well, I think that two things. I think this this bill misses what uh, what other states have done. Uh, that are further along in terms of New York, for instance, um, versus the um, a bill that's very similar to um, to 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 a strategy that's blanket uh, uh, such. And I think that we need to take a look at it. Maine has started to do that, and my right. suggestion is that you do it up front and take a look at it. And if I could, sir, uh, there are two steps to um, to your fiduciary responsibility. One is called procedural, okay, and that's where you do the study. You take a look at what you do. And then the second is called substantive, if I could say it correctly. And substantive is based on the, the analysis that you've done, based on the steps that you have taken to, uh, to look at that path. What are the decisions you're going to make based on that? And I think that we haven't done our job there. And I think we can collaboratively find a way to do that. And I would recommend stepping back, taking a look at that, bring in engine one if we can, bring in the folks from New York, and have the conversation about how we might want to structure this to get to our mutual goal. And I think that's, that that's possible. Said. Yeah. Well, then we're on the same page. Let's bring in the let's bring in the experts and have the conversation. Senator Rahm Hinsdale. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I, I do think we're on the same page that we want to look at other states that probably had similar conversations and reached the conclusion related to the path that they're on. I don't think anyone's married to this language versus what Maine and New York are doing. Can you? educate me, I'm quite curious, just what what would be diff substantially different about what Vermont has to consider from Maine and New York as we learn from them? Is it that we're invested in wildly different funds, our size, our decision, our policy related decisions? Are there huge differences in what we need to consider vis-a-vis -vis Maine and New York? Well, I think that when you look at Maine and what uh, the, the legislation went through, and now what you're looking at is the board reacting to it rather than have the um, the option of helping with what it might look like at the front end. And I think that con they're convening a, a group of experts. They're taking a look at the impact. They're, they're hiring a, a consultant. When we hired the consultant in, um, in uh, 2017, we stepped back. We let it be an independent process, and we let the, a group of folks, VPIRG, Sierra Club, Clean Yield, and 350, pick the consultant and then we work with them and they work with them and we step back after providing the information. I would like to see us look at some type of process that says, let's get our facts straight first. What Maine's now doing is having to do the same type of study and whether that changes legislation, whether that changes strategy, I think we should take a look upfront about what you would want in a bill to get to the point that you're trying to get to and do the work up front rather than have to come back and look at a bill later and say, well, that didn't work, we're gonna to have to do this. The, uh, the issue with New York and others is that they are larger, they have internal staff. Uh, you know, I, um, I once joked with somebody over in Kelpers and said, you, you've got four city blocks of staff. So oh, no, we're bigger than that. And I think they are. But uh, the, the issue is that they're, they're different in their structure and their ability to do internal things. So what's the alternative? Tom's done a great job and that's item number two on our uh, list of um, uh, the, the five point plan, which is to create a passive index fund. We now have one that's specific to Vermont because we tried to do one with a, a, a city out in uh, a very large city, larger plan than we did out in uh, California uh, with NEPC, our previous consultant, and it didn't work. There were just too many problems with it. We now have one and we hope we can put more money into a low carbon passive investment strategy. And we hope that we can offer that at some point that others can join it. And that means that we're also delivering a message to other institutional investment 
uh, in institutional investors that here there's a low carbon alternative that we vetted, it works, why don't you join us? And that creates a lot of, um, a lot of positive action toward, toward a low carbon economy. So I think that we need to have those conversations and then say, what does that mean in terms of the legislation you're going forward? I want a low carbon economy. I want to be able to, to, to have my, my, my grandchildren have, have a future that has an environment that works. That's why I spent so much time on clean water, to be very candid, and our natural resources. I also want them to have financial stability. And if they're in a retirement plan, I think we can do both. And I think we can do it well. But I think we need to put in the effort and do that up front. And I'm willing to spend the time to do that uh, with you as chair of the BPIC commission, ESG committee. Uh, uh, we're meeting later. We haven't met on this subject. So I can, I'm speaking for myself and my experience from the last effort. But I think that you would find the discussions about how you get to a policy that says, this is how we engage first. And this is what we look at for the alternatives when you can't get there. And how do we do that? And where do we do that? And what are the economic and fiduciary considerations in that as well? How do we do all that? And I think that you would have better legislation if you were able to take those steps up front. And I think Tom's willing to work with you. I know I'm willing to work with you. Um, and I do think that, um, uh, that most of the, the, the VPIC members are, are, are thoroughly engaged in this as well. We have an ESG committee. We've been doing all this work and, you know, and it has had results. And, uh, okay, well, that's yeah. that's yeah. Why we hear you. That's why we're here having this conversation. Yep. But you. I don't want. I really don't want us to go on without the other senators here, because otherwise we'll be repeating ourselves the next time Absolutely. we show up. Absolutely. I, I so just I, I always suggest thought. that we adjourn for the day and come it. back and have a further discussion, so we get to the bottom of this. And I think mm -hmm. we've all expressed the fact that there's some flexibility in our thinking. That we have a goal as to where we want to go. And we want to figure out the best way to get there. And with a lot we can learn from other places, but we need to move forward because if we're committed to climate change, we're committed to fighting climate change. We have to start taking these actions and consider the long-term return on investments as well. So I appreciate y'all being here, you two. And Tom, appreciate your going through your, your slides, even though you didn't show us the slides. I know appreciate, I should, appreciate your flexibility. Uh, I'm usually better at that. I apologize, uh, you know, but we'll be happy to, you know, and maybe create create some type of measure of success, Senator Ron Hinsdale, is, is what what would you like to see and how should we report it? You know, we're open in regards to, I know uh, I got a text from Eric in regards to some flaring example, Beth, that you collaborate on. So there's other examples that our, our staff is texting us, which they've been on the, maybe have them testify in regards to, well, what have they experienced and what are some of the things that we can report to you? I, today, I didn't, I didn't pull that together, but I, there are plenty of examples and, and with more, more emphasis on it, we could, we could focus on, well, what are measures of success? So five years from now, we can really point to, uh, mm -hmm. okay, we got to point A, now we're at point B, what's, what's point C without jeopardizing our long-term investment viability at the pension trust? Uh, that, yeah. that particular example was on my list. We'll let it go. We'll get back to it. But yep. um, I think that um, we're all on the same page. We want to do the right thing. We just want to do the right thing right together. So thank you. Okay. Have thank a you. good night. Yep. Take care.